Welcome to Sounding Scholarly Without Trying, Demystifying the Pressures of Doctoral Writing. And I am so excited to introduce you to our special guest, Louis Santani. Uh, Louis and I go way back. I love learning from this amazing human being. Not only is he an expert writer and a professor, he is a performer. And I love his mission, which is making the written word work better. So tonight I am so excited for him to share with you this paradigm of how is it that if you focus on the big picture first, regardless of what it is you're writing, right? Your dissertation, your doctoral project, a blog, even in his case, a stand-up comedy set. And I am wondering if we're going to get a couple little jokes in there today, Louis. <laughs> Focusing on that big picture and then letting the details come second really changes your journey. So, Louis, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Frederick, and thank you everybody who is here live and those of you listening in later. Uh, I think it's really cool how many people this uh, can potentially reach. And yeah, I'm here to to kind of <clears throat> hopefully uh, allay some some insecurities and fears that those of you who are working through your doctoral studies may have when it comes to writing. Um, I, I'm going to tell some stories. I'm going to give some advice. And ultimately, I, I want to make it clear that no matter what you're writing, th there is one constant. Very few writers at any point in their career feel like what they've written is any good when they get it on the page. And so the difference then between a writer who produces a lot of really strong content and one who doesn't is one who allows that critical voice to just be, keeps moving, and knows that there's a possibility of improving the writing as you move along. So that's where a lot of this is going to be uh, headed today. And uh, that's why I wanna start with the concept of the imposter phenomenon. This is something you've probably heard of outside of writing. It's something that we all have to certain degrees in our, in our lives. Uh, I, I remember the very first time I stood in front of a, a class as a teacher. I was 22 years old. I had just finished with my undergraduate degree. I looked at a group of middle schoolers, which is terrifying at any age at experience level. And uh, all I could think was, uh, I am not any smarter than them. And, and I knew intellectually that that wasn't true, but I had never told a group of people anything about my subject with any confidence because usually when I was speaking about my, my expertise, I was speaking to professors and other experts. And so all I thought in that moment was, oh, these kids are going to know. I'm going to be found out. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm a total fraud. And these are the exact same critical voices that really start appearing when we sit down to write. This is something that whether you are a 25-year uh, uh, professor and you're writing research, there, there's always this element of maybe this thing is going to get caught by somebody else and they're going to realize that I don't fully know what I'm doing. The difference with the 25-year professor and the student who's working toward that level is that we realize that a lot of our writing through revision and through our own kind of research and experience grows into something that actually has value and has critical uh, awareness uh, in a way that that one day we just wake up and we realize, I, I kind of do know what I'm doing, even if I don't feel like it at times. So the way it manifests then in writing, uh, apart from just the, the mere uh, imposter phenomenon, is, is usually through the words you've written. Sometimes you know that you have the knowledge, and it's more about the words. You say, oh, this just doesn't sound that smart. Other times you've plotted it out in your head, and you know exactly where you want to go. You have this chapter for your dissertation, and you are ready to drive forward. But as the words get onto the page, you reread them, and, you're, and you tell yourself, this isn't where I was going at all. This isn't accomplishing my goal one bit. And then uh, ultimately, if you're anything like me, you get to a point where you look at what you've written and you say, I hate this. And the last thing you want to do is keep sitting there and working on it, which, by the way, isn't the worst strategy ever uh, when it comes to working on your writing, it, sometimes walking away in the moment to make sure that you can overcome these brief uh, feelings that you're an imposter. So if we allow those things to win, right? It leads to all sorts of different negative consequences. The uh, most salient in, in most of our journeys is blank pages. I don't know how many times a student has told me that the most frightening thing to them is that blinking cursor. 
because then you start typing a sentence, you read half of it, you realize I don't like it, you delete, and there it is again. It's just in your nightmares, in your dreams. And this is this is one of the reasons why I often say that drafting and, and outlining by hand, or even this is kind of a really quirk that I have that not everybody has access to, but uh, I use a typewriter sometimes when I'm typing out a first draft because you're not allowed to delete. And I love knowing that what I've written is there for better or for worse, because I always tell students it's so much easier to turn something bad into something decent than to turn nothing into something good. So blank pages is the first consequence. More than that, though, we all are all busy. Many of you who are studying at an online university are, are also working full time, probably have families, relationships, so many other things. And if you allow this imposter phenomenon and this uh, write a little bit, delete it, try again, you're just wasting valuable time and ultimately frustrating yourself in the process, which really doesn't help uh, any of us get to where we want to be. So I'm here to tell you in this presentation, and we're going to really go into it deeper, but these are some things to remember. Nobody feels smart the first time they sit down to write. When, especially when you're starting on a major project like your dissertation, the last thing you feel is like you know exactly what you're doing. And that's fine because nobody writes it perfectly the first time. Uh, I believe Ernest Hemingway famously had to write the last chapter of A Farewell to Arms. I think he had to revise it 79 times I read somewhere before the editors accepted it. Uh, and this is one of the absolute, you know, most well-known authors in, in American literature. Uh, I, I think that there are stories of uh, Harry Potter not being published uh, by the first 20 some publishers who read uh, the letter. So assuming that you're gonna nail it on the first try puts undue pressure on yourself that even some of the most world famous authors uh, couldn't live up to. So try not to do that. And then lastly, and this is a really an important one to remember is that nobody's gonna judge your first draft and notice I put, or even read it. The first draft is for you. And it's for maybe your advisors, people who are close to you. But when it comes down to it, this notion that people are going to read our first draft and pass judgment on us gives us gives ourselves way too much credit. There's nobody looking over our shoulder wondering what we're doing before we're even close to finishing the dissertation, right? That's something that, like I said, your dissertation advisor, your chair, uh, and, and other readers are going to get to near the end. The first draft is for you, so don't feel like you need to impress anybody. So then. A question comes up from a lot of students. They say, well, okay, I hear what you're saying. You're taking the pressure off. Let's just throw some writing out there. What is, what is that going to do for me, though, when that writing is poorly done, when it sounds like I'm talking? It's not going to make me sound smart. So I'm here to tell you, though, that the key to writing in a scholarly fashion is starting with something ugly. Good writing does not sound uh, excellent the first time it hits the page it starts ugly. From ugly, it moves a little bit further into incomplete, at which point you're thinking, well, this still isn't very good. You keep working, it gets a little bit better. And by the end, you're going to see it's much better. And one day, maybe a month from now, two months, maybe longer, you're going to say, actually, this sounds pretty good. And when you submit it to somebody, they're going to agree with that because you started here without fear and you moved your way down to that level where uh, the writing was going to get a little bit more intellectual and a little, get, a little bit more polished. So let's kind of nail, nail it down into two areas then that I want to focus on. Because the reality about scholarly writing is that it is not something where you open up your head, pour out your ideas, and it's done. Okay, scholarly writing is strong because first and foremost, it is revised. And secondly, it is synthesized from other experts. The, one of the biggest, most frightening issues in writing at every level, especially doctoral, but I see this with my students who are 18 years old and are just start, starting college for the first time, is this notion that how do I write more because I only know this much. They think that writing is about showing what you know, but good scholarly writing is equal parts what you know, maybe, not, maybe actually less what you know, and more your responses, reactions, and your contributions to what has already been postulated and theorized in your field. There are a lot of people who have written about your topic before. You're not the first, and, and you're not going to be the last. So there's another reason to not feel so much pressure. You are entering a conversation, and your goal as a writer then is to say, what have others said about this? 
How can I put my own view into this conversation that one day the next upcoming batch of scholars will respond to? And this is a kind of endless recursive process that again, allows you to feel safe knowing you don't have to think of every word as though you're the one inventing this topic. So continuing on, let's get into what it means to have strong revised writing. I, I quote uh, Anne Handley here. She's got this great book that I teach to a lot of my courses. I actually have it right here. It is called Everybody Writes. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about um, just the processes that go into writing good content, Anne Handley writes, Everybody Writes. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really for content. It's kind of a modern book about writing, uh, kind of stuff for, for marketing, advertising, uh, and, and business. But some of its lessons can be applied to academic writing as well. And namely, the one that I love is The Ugly First Draft. This is a, a quote from her book. She says, much of writing paralysis is the result of expecting too much of ourselves the first time out. The example I gave earlier, you're staring at that blinking cursor on the screen and you don't know how to make that blinking cursor go away. It, it just makes you feel uh, inadequate. And no matter what you write, it's not going to make you feel any better. Part of the issue is that you're expecting yourself to be perfect the first time. I'm the biggest hypocrite in the world in this regard. When I sit to write, I am a constant reviser. I'm what, uh, what some people call a recursive reviser. I go, I go back after almost every sentence to see if it's doing what I want it to do. I often have to remind myself when I'm writing longer pieces of academic uh, text that, that it's better to just get the writing out there in an ugly form so that you don't paralyze your ideas and you can always go back and if it's bad the second time and third time through, you have the right to change it. But if you try to change it in that moment, you're going to, to use that word again, you're gonna paralyze your thinking process and whatever great ideas and, and these designs you started out with, they're going to slowly but surely kind of die out. We've all had that happen where we have these great ideas, we get a little bit into writing and, we, and we're like, what was I thinking again? Where did I wanna go with this? It's usually because we reached a, an obstacle and we didn't allow ourselves to work through it. We stopped there thinking that we had to address this other problem first and it slows us in the long run. So the ugly first draft then is something that I really want us to encourage ourselves to not be afraid of. Now, some people think, okay, ugly first draft, does that just mean stream of consciousness? Whatever comes to my mind, I write down. Different paths for different people. I, I, I'm not going to tell you that that's the wrong way to do it because some people work really well in that kind of stream of conscious space. I told you already that I'm somebody who's highly critical of every word I write. So that didn't work for me. Being somebody who just kind of, uh, you know, threw up words onto a page and rearranged them later, it never felt right for me. So instead, I decided that what was best for me was to kind of go back to, okay, What's the point of each sentence I'm writing and each paragraph when thinking about the entire package that is this, this text, this paper, this, this dissertation? So I'm bringing it back to some terms that you've, you've heard since you started writing at much lower levels, right? Topic sentence, uh, staying focused, uh, and then evidence, right? At any point when you're writing, it is safe to ask yourself before you've written a sentence or even after, what is the point right here? Am I trying to allow readers to know what the topic of this paragraph is going to be? Am I trying to uh, focus their attention on something important that just came up in a previous paragraph or that I'm going to bridge to later? Or am I about to bring uh, in some evidence that really supports and strengthens my view? If you know what your point is, then it's much easier to construct a sentence that accomplishes that goal. If I'm just sitting here trying to write a paragraph and I don't know where that paragraph is going, it gets incredibly difficult to know if what you're writing, A, stays focused, B, moves in the direction that you want to move, and, and ultimately C, whether or not you're rambling. So what I like to do then is I like to tell myself as step one in any paragraph that I'm working on is, okay, have I told my reader what the point of this paragraph is? And just focus on that sentence. I don't focus on the research yet. I don't focus on any of my uh, contributions or analysis, anything else. What's the point? I get that topic sentence out there. 
From there, I try to say, have I contextualized how I'm going to present this evidence to the reader in a focused manner? Meaning, have I given enough information about what the core issue is that this evidence is going to support? Have I discussed how the researchers I'm about to uh, bring into my piece, have I discussed what the parameters of their research was and how it relates to what I'm about to say? If not, put that in next. And then once you get to the evidence at that point, you have the beginnings of a strong paragraph and you can do this in any paragraph. It can be the first paragraph you're writing for the day or it could be body paragraph number 28 in a much longer piece, okay? And so then once you've done that, you wanna ask yourself within the sentence, what do I need? What is the purpose of this particular sentence? Uh, is it relating back to the topic sentences or the thesis or the overall goal of the paper enough? And then lastly, once you've asked yourself this, it's important that you don't just say more in that sentence or in the paragraph, it's that you do what needs to be done. So if for every paragraph, we need to kind of have a claim that you're, tr that, that you're attempting to illustrate or, or support, you need to have evidence or uh, some, some research, and then you need to have your synthesized explanation of how that research supports your point and, and your dissertation ultimately. That's how you're going to basically kind of, I, I used to draw it on a whiteboard when I would teach at almost like a math equation where if you multiply numbers, you can always go back and divide them by each other to see if it was the right answer. And the same goes for writing. If you've written a topic sentence and you've led into your evidence and then you've given all the research and then you've synthesized it, you can read your synthesis and say, does that relate back to my evidence? You can read that evidence and say, is that set up nicely before a topic sentence? And it kind of has that same forward and backward relationship that multiplication has with division in math. I got a nine-year-old at home. I'm working with basic math right now. So my mind is there, but I do think that's a helpful metaphor when you think about how to see if your writing is connecting. And then that third step in this ugly first draft process, once you kind of have all these questions answered, just write it, write it badly. Don't overthink it. You can go back later. So I always, I always say just, just students, students spend time trying to find the perfect word. Write the worst vocabulary you can the first time through. If you write the word good 20 times in your paper, here's what I say, good. Because you'll know what you were trying to say. You'll understand how you can revise that into a better vocabulary term later. And more than that, it won't stop your thinking process. Don't judge your grammar. Write a fragment. Write a run-on. That's why we have uh, programs like, like Grammarly. That's why we have Microsoft Word telling us if something is incorrect. That's why we have proofreaders and editors, okay? So don't be afraid. Focus on the goal of the sentence, the purpose of the paragraph, and then the connections between what you're doing. Go back to these little things later, okay? And so that's really how you focus on the more revised side of your writing. And you might say, okay, but I still don't feel like I'm sounding scholarly yet, right? You, you just told me to write in my own voice. I don't sound like a scholar. Again, th there's multiple parts to sounding scholarly. And the first part is getting stuff down. We'll work on the voice in revision, but then here's how we make sure that our points aren't just opinions that we're spouting out without a whole lot of uh, ground beneath them. And that's through synthesis, okay? Another great book, Another one that I have right here uh, is called They Say, I Say. This is a uh, kind of um, lower level writing book for, uh, I, I, we would teach it in our uh, composition courses at different universities at, at, when students entered. But it's called They Say, I Say. It's by uh, Gerald Graff, Kathy Birkenstein. And what I love about this book is it urges students to see writing as a conversation where you are taking what others have said first, they say, and you're contributing your own view to this larger discussion, I say. And so this is where you really get that sort of scholarly approach to your writing where you don't just sound like you're telling your opinions on your own soapbox. What's important, according to this text, is not only expressing your ideas, but of presenting those ideas as a response to some other person or group. The highest levels of intellect and the highest levels of expertise in your field, whatever it may be, don't come from individuals who are sitting alone in a room dictating to others. It comes from spirited, healthy debate, 
from people who have questioned theories and proposed new ones, from people who have uh, kind of, by building two theories together, have created a hybrid third theory. That's where the smartest and most innovative ideas come from, okay? So kind of to reiterate something I said earlier, but to move it a little bit forward, good scholarly writing is not just a list of what you've learned and what you know, and it's also not ideas that defy everything ever written, meaning you're not expected to enter your field with ideas that nobody's ever even conceived of before. That's way too much pressure. If all of us have to think of a brand new notion that has never been set to paper before, it's kind of like asking a musician to write a song with notes that have never been played before. Great music is not composed from brand new notes, but from sequences of notes that already exist that can kind of combine together in innovative and creative ways. And think of the researchers in your field as individual notes that you're putting together to create your own beat, okay? Which means good writing then is a response to these other uh, experts. It is a combination of their ideas and it is a compromise between you and other experts in the field where you're meeting in the middle and maybe making a few concessions along the way as you realize that, you know what? A lot of other people have put their oars into this river of ideas and have come up with some pretty darn good uh, contributions that I can use to make my ideas stronger and a little bit more precise. Now, synthesis, of course, which I didn't define, and, and in, in case I need to, synthesis is when you take a series of ideas from other people and combine them into a focused kind of uh, directed idea for yourself. Okay, it's where I take maybe three people who have come up with contributions to theories about depression. And I say, you know what, if I add those three together, I think that here's what really we can combine them to say. And now I have my argument formulated from those three. Okay, so then synthesize is not just a summary of each one, putting them next to each other. It is not picking the best one and being done with it. And it's also not just saying, here's what one person said. Here's what another person said. Here's what a third person said figure it out for yourself, okay? There is this direct responsibility on you as the writer to say, hey, I'm going to tell my reader how I view these voices in combination. And ultimately you're responding to them by kind of agreeing, kind of disagreeing, so on and so forth. And so here are some uh, terms that I, when I think of what synthesis really is about, uh, and I and I get the yes but and no but really from the they say I say text, but you are thinking of yourself as in a conversation with your researchers. Don't allow the research to become the be all end all of the discussion. You, as a new contributor to your field of expertise, are are not saying because these infallible researchers before me have found this, we should listen only to them. What you're saying is because these researchers who have engaged in viable, respectable research have contributed these thoughts in combination, I am going to add this. Some of what you add is going to be founded in agreement with what you've read. Some is going to be founded in disagreement. You might find a theory that you just say, you know what? This based on my research, doesn't seem to hold weight the same way that other research does. But it's, all, it's not that simple. Uh, it's not as simple as just saying yes or no to things. Sometimes you're gonna agree with a portion of the research, but maybe a method they go into or a conclusion they've drawn isn't exactly where you would go. Other times it's gonna be the opposite where you say, for the most part, I actually don't think this theory is right, but let me be clear about one thing that they really do kind of hit the nail on the head. All of these responses, when you think about it, give you so much more space to explore your actual argument with, without the pressure of feeling like you have to be the one inventing the argument. Other arguments already exist on it and you're responding based on whatever research that you've done and synthesized together. And I wanted to show this really cool thing. I get this from the University of uh, Arizona Global Campus Writing Center. It's just something that uh, we, we've comprised over there to really show that, that synthesizing writing can be almost brought down to a formulaic process. 
let's say hypothetically you are writing your dissertation on the effects of social media or technology uh, on, on young people, mainly with regards to depression, anxiety, and self-esteem. Now, I want to be clear that I actually made up this chart. These aren't real research studies. So if you are in this field you're, and you're wondering who these names are, I just wanted to create a chart that was illustrative of how you can use this. Uh, these are actually my friend's names. And uh, the research is just kind of uh, me just trying to show an example, right? But uh, let's say you have four research articles that you really want to combine in a section of your uh, of your dissertation or your, your doctoral project, okay? Now, notice that maybe one of the articles is only about depression, okay? That top article doesn't say anything about anxiety or self-esteem. Well, that's fine. That doesn't mean you can't use it just because it doesn't reach all three of the points that you're trying to make. Because as you move down in the research, you see that the, the other uh, third and fourth articles, those ones comment not only on depression, but also one on anxiety, one on self-esteem. And then there's that second article that is also about anxiety and self-esteem. Here you can now create paragraphs, sections. Maybe you have a section about the way depression relates to social media use. And in that section, you can synthesize Jones, Holstein, and Copeland and then as you move into your section about depression relating to anxiety, well, now you have Thompson Parker and Holslin again, okay? This is how you bridge between ideas, and this is how you get more substantial research into your piece without having to just write a paragraph for each individual point. This allows you to say, well, look at what uh, um, Holslin and Thompson and Parker have each said about anxiety, and how can I relate those two ideas to one another so that I can come up with my own thought about what this means? The whole point of this, of this presentation is writing scholarly or sounding scholarly without trying. Well, once you've combined two other researchers, or in this case, several other, right? We have Thompson Parker, and then there's an et al. So you're putting a bunch of people into this conversation. Once you combine them and then give your own analysis and explanation of how you feel all of those points interact with one another, you've achieved sounding scholarly without even trying because you've included that intertextuality that is so integral to academic writing. You've provided your own response. You've entered the conversation. And then this all goes back to the first rule, not just synthesized, but then you go back and revise it to sound like it fits into this genre, before you know it, you have paragraph upon paragraph of scholarly writing that not just looks and feels scholarly, but engages in substantive ways with other scholars. And there's nothing else to call your work at that point, but scholarly writing. So in the end, to kind of give a sort of summative uh, view of what I've said over the past about half hour here, is scholarly writing doesn't have to be scary. It is just you putting your ideas down on the page, bringing in other experts and responding to those ideas, and in the end, revising your language so that it works in this genre. If you break it into small parts like that, just throw down the ugly first draft, include all the necessary stuff, and over time, you'll get to something that, hey, actually is pretty good. I, I always love to tell this to my students. Um, they, they say, well, well, but I don't sound smart enough. Well, you know what sounds smart? Words that you know. And so when you just start a writing process by writing what you know in language you know, revision is where you can kind of beef it up and make it have that more uh, linguistic flair. You can have it fit into the genre with some uh, lingo and terms that are that are specific to the jargon of your field. But when you try to do that up front, you're going to get these sentences that have these uh, missed meanings, have ideas that uh, aren't exactly uh, hitting the nail on the head like you want. I just had a student today write a paper where they they didn't want to say that the, that uh, someone was reviewing. So uh, they tried to find a synonym for review. And and somehow they ended, landed on the word looking over. And so they wrote overlooked. And in, as you know, overlooked means something totally different than, than reviewing. It means that you completely missed it, right? And so by trying to sound smart the initial time, they use a complete opposite word and it ended up making their sentence and paragraph lose a lot of meaning. I told them, what are you trying to say? They told me, we put in the simple word in revision, they can find something better if they want.
So that's how you sound smart, using words you know. Ultimately, trusting yourself to revise and, sy and synthesize the works of others, making sure you don't put the pressure on yourself. You're not writing this alone. As I said earlier, you're not the first person to enter your field. And trust me, you won't be the last. You're not going to end the scholarly studies. Uh, you're not going to say something that's so, uh, you know, uh, beyond debate that everybody else in your field is going to say, well, I guess we're done. That person said it. No, this is always going to be a conversation. And so remember that by bringing other people in and then working your way through your own words, you can sound scholarly without feeling the pressure. Uh, I do have uh, these these resources if anybody is interested in them, but um, I, I am sure uh, Dr. Frederick can can guide you to these. But ultimately, you can all sound like scholars. You you have gotten to where you are for a reason, and you don't need to feel uh, the pressure of doing it on a minute to minute basis. Um, if if you go slow and and you follow these tips. So with that, I'm going to leave it for the Q and A. Uh, I think I I think I hit the nail on the head, Dr. Frederick. Thirty minutes. The question and answer period started with someone asking for advice for scholarly writing when English isn't your first language. And Louis' first suggestion was, if the issue is getting your thoughts on paper and it's easier for you to do that in your native tongue, then do that. Because remember, the more important thing is to get something on paper and then you can work on refining it later. Personally, I have had experience with students who have worked really well with either writing coaches or editors where that is their specific area of expertise, working with people who are writing a scholarly paper in English when that isn't their first language. Next, we engaged in a lively discussion about feedback and why is it that it feels sometimes just so terrible to get feedback about your writing. In short, Really, the take-home message here boiled down to seeing the feedback that your faculty, that your peers are giving you as a gift, a gift to help you refine whatever it is that you're working on, whether it's a class paper or your dissertation, and get it to where it needs to be to meet the requirements. So we talked about a podcast episode number 18, How to Feel Good About Feedback. That's a Happy Doc student podcast episode with Dr. Kelly Stewart Olson. Amazing suggestions on that one. Next, we shifted to the literature review, chapter two of the dissertation or doctoral project. And the suggestion there was to listen to episode number 85, with Dr. Ellen Beatty, how to write a literature review. The next question was, how do you deal with feelings of overwhelm when you spend so much time reading, reading, reading research articles, and then you need to stop your reading and start writing, but you're feeling stressed and a little frazzled? And the suggestion there was to break up those tasks to really make sure that before you sit down to write, you have taken the time to get yourself in a state of calm, that you are thinking clearly, that you're at your cognitive best. Know when it's the best time for you to write. Are you a early bird? Are you a night owl? And again, often sometimes you just need to give yourself a break. Get outside, take a walk in nature, maybe even take a nap. But if you need to shift from the reading of the research to the writing of the research, sometimes carving out a gap, a space in between those two activities is going to make you more productive. Last, we talked about that synthesis matrix that Louis demonstrated. He had an example there during the presentation. And the webinar that immediately preceded this one, webinar number nine on systematic note taking, really dug deep into a synthesis matrix. So if you haven't watched that one, you definitely will learn a lot from that. So I encourage you to check out webinar number nine from the 2022 series. November's webinar will actually be pre-recorded. If you are registered for these, you will receive a link to the recording. Dr. Burris and I are at a conference presenting but his presentation, How to Convince Yourself to Doctoral Completion, is definitely one you will not want to miss. So again, we will not be meeting in real time, but you will be sent a link. Thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to meeting up with you in real time in December.